Hey everybody, this is Bill Smith from Privacy Fight Club. We did an excellent Q&A with John this past Saturday, answered a lot of your questions, and I think you're going to find it very, very helpful. So without further ado, here we go. And, uh, we're doing a Q&A this morning, and John has a great agenda for us. He's going to uh, share his screen in just a minute. And yes, this is being recorded, and we will repost this at privacyfightclub.com. Uh, and you'll be able to rewatch it and share it with all your loved ones. <laughs> so, John, what do you what do you have for us? Today? We're gonna. I know we're gonna do a Q and A, so people can get their questions ready. And I would say, uh, say hello in the chat, and uh, definitely get your question ready to go in that chat for John, and uh, he'll address anything you want today. Th so, thanks, Frank. Well, well, I I would wanted to just give a list of a couple of things I wanted to cover, and the purpose of what I'm doing here today, and and if we could do that, and then do the questions, and certainly we can we can talk about whatever. We can have a discussion, basically. But I, w I wanted to m uh, make this recording so that I want people to be informed about what they're, what they're using the crypto asset to make money. And I want them to understand more of the tax situation, more than what you're going to get from a CPA. And I'm not a CPA. I wouldn't say that I'm an expert on any tax law at all, but I understand about liability. And so that's what we're really going to talk about. And I'll show you some things that we really, um, I, I just gave you a quick example. I was, I was helping someone. We did a, um, we did a, a settlement trust, which I'm, some of you are familiar with. Okay, I, I, I had one, someone open an account in Canada yesterday, and he said he took the trust contract over to an attorney to notarize it. And the attorney asked him if an attorney helped him write it. And he said, no, he said a friend of his did it, which of course, you know, came from our database. And uh, the attorney said, he, he said he looked shocked, surprised. And you know, that's the thing. Um, attorneys think that they're the only ones that can read. And so I want you to understand that um, we can read this stuff. Okay. Now, if you ask me to do brain surgery, forget it, but this is reading and let's not be afraid of this stuff. That's really what I want. The message I want to get. And I'm going to walk you through some details and no, it's not exciting. It's very boring, but I want you to look under the hood, hood a little bit and see what, what's going on. Um, just this morning, I got, someone asked me um, from, um, she got, she received a, um, a 1099B from Upwork, I'm sorry, not Upwork, Uphold. Uphold is the, uh, another crypto exchange, which is pretty cool by the way. But anyways, um, she was sent a 1099B. Now we're gonna cover US tax system, we're gonna cover foreign, we're gonna cover Canada, UK, all those things. So, but uh, let me just focus a little bit on the details here. Um, the 1099B, let, I'm, gonna go sh I'm gonna do a share screen and I'm gonna show you guys what it looks like. Um, all right. So in that browser, here's a 1099K, but here's a 1099B. So this is what she got. She got it by email, I believe. It's all these parts. Now, if you'll notice, everybody can see this, right, Frank? It's visible? Uh, looking good, John, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so in the top right where you see my mouse pointing, it says proceeds from broker and barter exchange transactions. So you got to think this stuff through. She's on uphold with cryptos. And we're only talking like $200, I think. It's just a small amount. I don't know if she sold them yet. I have to, I asked her that, but um, what I wanted to know from her is if she was involved as, if she was receiving or trading in some way as a broker of cryptos, <laughs> which she's not because she'd have to have a license to do that and a barter exchange transaction. So this, this tax report, this tax like notice to the IRS pertains to barter exchanges. Now, how is there a barter exchange when you don't have a two parties trading something? You've got an exchange like a bank and you're putting currency, let's call it just currency, it's not really, but let's say it's currency and this bank is holding it for you and then you're doing something with the currency, you're going from, well, let's say one currency to another currency or whatever. Um, that's not a barter even. There's no barter because there's no, there's no exchange, no one's, paying for service or a product. So mm -hmm. just that alone, we need to look at this stuff. And let me go, uh, let me just do one thing real quick. I got to do one thing. Um, okay. Sorry about that. Someone's asking to join. So I sent him the link. Um, so that's a 1099B. Um, let's flip over to this 1099K. This is what most of us get from the exchanges. Now I've only seen 1099Ks from the exchanges. And this te deals with payment cards. Mm -hmm. Now I'm laughing. I'm laughing at the uh, the comment. 
she, she's in the comments and she said, I am not a broker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're not brokers. This, this is our money. We're putting it here and then we're going to take it out. The people this in chat even... are trying to buy Bitcoin from her. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and so what, what the, okay, we'll get into that in a second. But so payment card, see now this is 1099K, payment card and third party network transactions. I know we don't speak in this language. I'm going to tell you what this means. And don't take my word for it, because I'm going to show you right now what it, look, what it is. It's merchant processors. And I'm going to tell you what that is. A merchant processor is that service that's being used when you use a credit card at the point of sale. Like when you go to the grocery store and you give them your credit card, there's a processor that handles the money, moves from your account into the bank, and then does what's called settlement of the funds. It clears the funds, makes sure that everything's good, and then remits the funds to the merchant. The, the grocery store, for example, you're not doing any of those things. There's no, again, no buying and selling going on. So when you get that 1099K, I'm not, I don't even use this, what I just told you. I don't even use that fact when I go to the IRS and get them to agree that it's not reportable. Uh, be, but I could. It's just, th there's so many problems with there being a tax on this. There is no tax whatsoever. I want you to understand that. So let's look at the rules that come into play here. Now, here's the, here's the interesting thing. The IRS does not have a form system or regulatory framework to talk about crypto transactions because compare using a merchant account, using your credit card at a restaurant with using a crypto exchange. Totally different because no one's selling a product and the, there's no payment being processed through a third party, right? It's just you put some money in a crypto exchange, and then you take it out, right? There's no customer on the other end or there's no supplier on the other end. But look at what they're, here's the regulatory uh, framework that pertains to what they're trying to do. I'm flipping over to um, this, this statute, okay? It's 6050W. And the way you find it is, you just simply search on 26 USC, okay? And then you put in 6050W. That's what's behind all these 1099s. And you're going to laugh when you see it has nothing to do. Not, I'm not saying that they have to use the word cryptographic currency. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not, being, I'm not talking about semantics. I'm talking about the material aspect of what they're regulating. They are not regulating cryptos. So what they're trying to do, I'm telling you, the, the accountants are being threatened and they're saying, you're going to have to do this. You're going to have to tell your company, advise them to send out this 1099 of some sorts. And here's what it applies to. It applies to the payment settlement entity, which is the service that works for the bank that clears the funds. And that's my language. But if you click on this link, you'll see the definition. And, and there's a participating payee, which is supposed to be, I guess, you, me? No. If we look at the definition, let me click on this and you'll see how this works. Okay, now it pops up a screen that gives me a definition. Y'all can see this, right? Yep. Okay, now this actually shows up later on in the statute. So instead of me paging down, I'm just going to click on the link, right? But look at this. Here's a participating payee who would get the 1099. In the case of a payment card transaction, and let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, they're saying it's cards like credit cards and debit cards. Okay, any person who accepts payment, a payment card as payment. Okay, there's your restaurant, grocery store, online merchant. In the case of a third-party network transaction, any person who accepts payment. So you've got two, you've got two conditions here. It's any person who, who accepts payment through a payment card transaction. So a credit card. Are you accepting credit cards? Are you accepting debit cards? Are you accepting payment in Bitcoin for anything? Not even that. I mean, just give them the benefit of the doubt and change this payment card into Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, right? It still doesn't apply. And then in the case of a third-party network transaction merchant account, any person who accepts payment from a third-party settlement organization, well, I, there, there, in order for there to be a settlement, there has to be a, a trading going on. There has to be like, I'm buying a product or service from somebody. I am paying for a service at the exchange, but the exchange is the party, right? You're, you're dealing with the party. So there's two parties. There's no middleman, mm. right? I mean, you, you can tell me, but I can read. Now, here's what's interesting. It's a side note. I want you to take notice of this, though. They exclude from this definition 
parties who have a foreign address. Huh. So what's a foreign address? Well, it could be a NAT code. Some of you know what that is. So you could take your residential address and convert it to a NAT code and use that address. And now all of a sudden you're excluded as a payee. Not that this applies to you anyways, but it's just interesting to note that it's very easy to set up a foreign address in another country as well, but I'm not gonna, we don't care about all that. I'm just saying, this is what we're dealing with, okay? So let's not be afraid of it. Um, okay, what I just showed you was a statute. I know this is a little scholastic, so just bear with me. <clears throat> Some of you really want to know this. Some don't care. I know you shut down when I start talking like this. But <laughs> let, you know, shut down. <laughs> if you told me how to change the oil in my car, I would shut down too. Okay. So I have my weakness. Um, <laughs> That's how I get when people give me directions. <laughs> there, I just yeah, know right. I'm going to Google it and I'm not hearing what you're saying. Exactly. All right. So <laughs> the, the way they get this convoluted mess set up is Congress passes some law, then it's codified into these statutes, right? Yeah. Now the statute is meaningless unless the agency's director or the agency of the secretary writes regulations. And of course you got a group of attorney, attorneys doing one thing on Congress. Then you got a group of attorneys codifying it into statutes. Then you got another group of attorneys doing this, converting the statute into a regulation. Mm -hmm. And if you'll notice, it's numbered in a very similar way. It's, if I can even get to the top, gosh, they make it, this is very detailed. The regulation tells you everything. Okay, so look how they number it. Before it was 26 USC 6050. Now it's 26 Code of Federal Regulations, CFR. This is a symbol for the word section. And they put 1.6050 W-1, which is kind of scary because that means there must be a two, three, four, five, six, seven. I mean, this goes on forever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and this is significant too. You don't need to be concerned about that. But I'm just going to show you here, if you want to get into some real good very specific definitions. This is what I had to read and go through for like days and days to write the request for determination letter. And if you read the request, you'll be like, okay, well, you know, none of this stuff applies. And see, they even talk about foreign payees here, but again, it's payees. And I, and I wrote that request giving the benefit of the doubt to the IRS and still the IRS said, yeah, you're right. You don't have, it's not subject to backup withholding. Um, mm. All right, so so we're buying cryptos. We want to trade. Like I said, I think it's a really good idea to go into the exchange uh, with a stable coin like True USD or your favorite stable coin because you're just one to one with the local currency, and then go into Atomic Wallet or Exodus and then do your allocation, uh, and then that way no one there's no trail, right? The only thing the only thing that's going to be different is that now this is an important thing I want to share with you all. <clears throat> I'm going to, I'm going to lead into the rest of this. When you, when you're doing this, you go into the exchange with your stable coin. So let's say you put a thousand dollars into Coinbase and I buy a thousand true USD tokens. And I, then I trade those from my true USD token on atomic wallet or Exodus or my BitFi or my ledger or, or you know, Trezor or whatever. And then I, I reallocate it to the coins that I really want, like Bitcoin cash and Neo and things like that. Then when I make the money I want and I go to take profits, I'm gonna go back into, let's say I wanna use Coinbase. For some reason I need to use Coinbase. Remember I came in with a thousand tokens or a thousand dollars. And now I've got, let's say a hundred thousand, right? I can go back into my stable coin, back into Coinbase, but I'm moving now a hundred thousand dollars worth before I, I, pay, I bought a thousand dollars worth. Now I'm moving a hundred thousand back onto Coinbase. So you can see that. So then the question is, where did you get that money from? There's no record of that. I mean, unless you go through the blockchain, I mean, you can make it to where there is no record of it. There is a record, but it's so difficult to find it. And it's really, it doesn't even matter. And yeah, that's a huge amount of money compared to $1,000. So I can then sell the 100,000 true USD for $100,000. And I can put it in my personal account. And if I did that, I really should report it. I should get a 1099, I probably will, and I should put on my 1040. If I put that 100,000 into a company, like a limited liability company, and it's gonna be used as a pass-through, well, then it's gonna sit there, and I do my thing with it. So this is where people have a lot of a question. Like, if, if I did that, and I put my 100,000 in cash in my LLC, and I wanna give uh, $10,000 as a gift to somebody, it brings up all these issues about gift tax, because we're so conditioned to talk 
the language of the tax code. And yeah, you can get, go along with that. So now you have the gifty and the gift door and all this stuff, but that brings your LLC into the tax system. And the only thing that matters at that point, if you want to talk about gifting and you want to talk about tax deductions in a situation like that, cost basis, when you start talking like that, then you're going to have to file a tax return and fall under all the categories of qualifications and privileges and exemptions. And I would just suggest to you that you're better off to skip all that language and stop being so smart about the tax code and just move the money the way you need to move it and don't realize a gain until you have to. Because what I tell people is you're stepping over the dollars to get to the pennies if you're concerned about tax deductions and cost basis and all these things. So move your money, do the thing you're going to do with it. If you want to give somebody some money, give them some money and let that person deal with any tax situation if he has one. And if he doesn't know enough how to avoid it, maybe you can show him or maybe he can figure it out. That's, that's what I like to do. If, if the person doesn't know, then it's on him because it's his money. I'm not going to deal with the tax system so I can start qualifying things as a gift. It's up to you. I'm just suggesting that that would be a, a good way to look at it. So in the United States, in that tax system, and we can get into some more details. I think I'm going to let you guys do Q&A just shortly, but let me explain one thing. There's, there's two things going on here. In the U.S., I can perpetually defer a tax situation almost forever, okay, perpetually, almost. Um, but I can also do another thing. I can reduce the value of it, and I can also I can reduce the value of, it, of a principal. So, for example, let's say I had a windfall of a million dollars, and who cares where it came from? I just have a windfall of a million dollars. And... I can either, I can, I can treat it, I can create a loan situation with it. I can put it into a vehicle, like I can put it into an IRA, right? Or I can pass it through to an asset if I don't take a gain, right? I can do those things. Um, but I can also diminish the value. And there's a, there's a couple ways to do that. One is, and I'm not saying you need to go understand this, but just to mention it, there's something called, um, it's called a, uh, a grantor retained annuity trust, G-R-A-T. And it's, it consists of an LLC that does file a tax return as an S-Corp, and it also consists of an annuity contract. This is a complex structure that I do not set up. Some accountants do set these up. If I were going to do one, I would use a CPA. They, are, they do have good purposes, good uses. So for things like that, you want to go to a CPA that does things like this. It's called a GRAT, a Grantor Retained Annuity Trust. And this is what I'm showing people in the UK and in Canada, especially, because I'm not comfortable yet telling them to do things that we do here or don't do here. I'm not comfortable telling people in the UK, don't report or file a tax return because I don't know what's going on over there. I don't, I don't have experience with their laws, but I do know that there's some basic principles that we can use over there. So I'm explaining what that is. In the GRAT, I can put a million dollar windfall and... I can do one of two things at that point. I can diminish the value of it immediately to 50% of the value. So my million dollars is now taxable as a half a million dollars. Or I can wait it out for two years and I can diminish the value to zero and I can pay no tax on it. That's legal and it's right in the IRS statutes and you can have a CPA do that. You just have to be willing to wait two years to get your, you know, your whole amount out. So Not there are tools. A million dollars. That sounds Except, like a way that, to do that is yeah, it's a really <laughs> slick way. So if you guys are really scared about not filing and all this stuff, I mean, you could you could put your money in and use a grat and and so it gets cumbersome and you have to wait a bit. So anyways, there are tools. Um, but here's so what the, what happens? I'm gonna tell you how this works just briefly without getting too technical. But the S corp has stock, and it's an accounting function that makes the stock devalued immediately by 50%. There's some rule they can do this by. And then if you wait two years and put it into an annuity, you can take a lump sum after two years. You can also take the annuity payments over the two years. I believe you can. But what they're doing is devaluing the stock, which represents the value of the million dollars. That's all they're doing. So they're just diminishing, the, diminishing it that way. So what I do on, uh, like on, um, Canadian and UK accounts is with the limited partnership, we're creating a foreign owner of 80%. We can do this with an LLC, by the way, but let's just say um, a limited partnership, not a limited liability partnership, but a limited partnership. There's a difference because in those countries like Canada, I believe a limited, par a limited liability partnership is for professionals like doctors and attorneys and things like that, I think is how they do it over there. 
but the limited partnership is very generic and we could do it for anything, especially investors. I make a foreign company that I set up here and we could do it in Zimbabwe, it doesn't matter. But we just happen to set up here because it's so fast and easy. I can set up a new Mesco LLC and make it the 80% owner on paper. It becomes the nominee and it's a real person, okay, because it's a company. It's not a fake, it's not a fictitious name. It's actually a real legal person. It's a US person. And it becomes the 80% owner of the limited partnership that I'm doing in Canada or the United Kingdom. So now what's happening is that person that I'm helping is still paying, he's still filing in whatever he's gonna normally do, but I'm taking 80% of the value away from his taxes. So he's only gonna be taxed on 20% or 10% or whatever we can get away with, right? For now, at some point, I know I'm gonna figure out that like, for example, in the partnership contract, I talked to an accountant there uh, recently and he was telling me a couple of things. And, and so basically, I believe the liability in Canada and probably it's the same for the UK, the liability for the tax comes when you close the books and you have, you have um, cash, what they're called capital accounts for each of the members and partners. When you set up your partnership deed or the partnership agreement, in there is accounting, they're accounting practices. They're not rules or laws, they're just practices. And the practice is to allocate capital to each member and then put a name on it, right? And then close your books and do an audit. That's what they do every year. Then there's no law that I can see that requires this to be done. You, why couldn't you keep your books open perpetually, right? I'm, now I'm just talking a little bit of theory. I'm just, I'm wanting you to think, think this through a little bit. A lot of the liability that we run into is because of what we do. So it's the same thing in Canada and the UK, as far as using a limited partnership, you can diminish your, the tax by, by separating out the ownership of the windfall, of the value, okay? Like we did with the GRAT, okay? And from there, you can, you can do a lot of other things. I'm just saying generally, you can do that. And there's other ways too. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna run down a list and I know there's a lot of detail in it, but let me just, and you've heard me before when you all talk to me on the phone, um, I'm just going to go to the list. If I want to take profits and I'm going to use my LLC at the exchange. Now you can do this without an LLC at the exchange, but you still need some way to, to acquire the property, the asset in a different name than yours. It has to be a third party. So we could talk about that, but I can borrow the money out as you've heard me describe. Now I can do it like I can pay off a mortgage and record a new mortgage and I can make my uncle Bob the lender, or I can make uh, an LLC, the lender, which is preferred. I would use a company as the lender. I write up all the paperwork and I simply get a payoff statement from my bank. I, I paid off from my LLC account where I sold my cryptos. And then I would simply within a month, which is a reasonable time, I just made up that date though, by the way. So just, I would say within a reasonable time, you would record another mortgage with your company that you own as the lender and then have a record of those payments. So that's the simple version of it. I know it may add to, lead to some questions. We'll talk about that. Okay, a better way to do it, a little more sophisticated when you're dealing with a lot of money or when you're dealing with a lot of small transactions, like people ask, what about spending $5,000 on my vacation? And I always been, I've been saying, that's taxable, just report it. But you can get around that too, if you think big. So once you start taking profits, a large amounts of profits, you can actually use a whole life policy. Infinite banking is what it's called. You can use a whole life policy. You can borrow the money out on a quarterly basis by setting up poli uh, whole life policies, or you can do it on an annual basis or whatever's gonna work in your situation. And the way this works without getting into too much detail is you can, you can set up the whole life policy, spend the money from, your, from the cash in your LLC account where you just sold your cryptos. You can fund the policy this way. Then within a period of time, you have to wait a little bit. You can take the money out and do whatever you want with it and never pay it back if you pay in advance the interest on the a contract, if you did that. Now there are versions of that. So I'm just saying generally, you can do this whole thing tax-free if you use some of the tools that have been around for a hundred years, okay? Um, same thing with a car. If I wanna go, well, similar thing. With a car, if I just wanna, I don't wanna deal with whole life, I'm going to spend $80,000 for a nice car and I'll go in there and pay cash for it. What I'll just do simply in my conversation with the dealers, I'll say, look, I've already got a lender. Let's work out our deal. I get the number on a piece of paper. I'm sitting, I'm looking at the contract right here. I just tell them, look, I'll be right back after lunch. I leave, I go to my bank. This is the bank account for the LLC where you sold your cryptos and got dollars. 
I get a certified check for the total amount for the car. I go back to the dealership and uh, I do my deal, right? Now, I, the, now the dealer's gonna wanna know the name of the lender. So I'm gonna, I'm, the lender's gonna be my LLC, whichever one I wanna use. You can use pretty much any LLC because it's just a loan. It's not an ownership situation, so you'll be fine, even temporarily. So the lender is going to be your LLC and you give him the check and then you, he'll need the LLC's address and a EIN. Okay. In the state, you'll need a tax number. He'll, well, he'll need all that stuff because he's going to probably issue a 1099 or something to the LLC. Um, and yes, you can use your home address for this, whatever is convenient because it's the, it's the rights in the contract that are important. If you want privacy, well then, okay, fine. Uh, you know what to do there. You can set up your you know, mailbox or whatever you're going to do. So that's for a car. Um, let me think. Uh, what else? Let me let me just stop there because I know there's other there's other examples. So I'll let you guys prompt me on that. But those are the general ones, okay? Frank, let's just do that. Let's let's start with some questions if we can. Do I look in <laughs> chat here? <clears throat> yep, some questions okay. in, in the uh, the chat. So right. let me scroll back a little bit here. Um, first question I see is here from Tara at the bottom. So if you've got questions, now's the time to throw them in. Whole life policy, I'm concerned with current creeks and financial system. Aren't we introducing more risk by involving a possibly unstable insurance company? Good question. Okay. The insurance company that these companies are not invested in the banking system. They do not buy stock. And the, in 200 years, there's never been a default on a contract ever. So no, you're out of the banking system with this li these life contracts. Yeah. Now, that's another subject. I mean, we can, we can cover that. So I, I would not lead someone into a situation like that. The banks are bad enough, but no, these, they're, they're, they're no, there's no counterparty risk that we're familiar with, like mortgage-backed securities and things like that. Right. Uh, Tango, good question. Is it okay to re reallocate inside ShapeShift? Because my wallet uses that and it's free. Uh, real quick, so unless I'll, I'll start this one, John, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. uh, when you're talking about shape shift, I don't believe shape shift has any kind of KYC or anything like that. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. I, I know that the, that company has made a lot of changes since, since I've really looked at it. So someone please tell me if you need to give a username or anything with shape shift, but if shape shift is, uh, you know, shape shift for those who don't know is a tool built into a lot of, uh, it, well, it's its own platform. You can go there and basically, it's an ex it's it's a an exchange, but it's a very user friendly exchange. It's not like Binance where you're trading. You're more just going and saying, "Okay, here's my Litecoin. Can I have some Bitcoin instead?" And then you turn it over. So Tango, if there's something that I'm Tango Maniac, <laughs> if there's something I'm missing, I just realized it's not an actual name. Um, if there's something I'm missing and, t and they have a, a more robust thing that you had to sign up for, my point being, that's as anonymous as your Bitcoin wallet. So you're, you're talking about something you're doing there that's uh, not going to be tracked or seen or anything like that. So, you know, if I'm understanding the product right, uh, the only reporting that would ever happen on that is if you, for some reason, decided to get really granular on the things you wanted to tell the government. <laughs> yeah. Uh, John, yeah, and, and ShapeShift is an application, I believe. And I believe a lot of the, a lot of the like Atomic Wallet uses ShapeShift, I think. Oh, yeah. ShapeShift is everywhere. They've been very successful yeah. at becoming sort of the go-to way to trade cryptos. It's in the Exodus wallet. Yeah. So here's a, here's a rule trade as in transfer between coins. So if you're going to, okay, if you're going to follow my recommendation and, and, and not allocate on an exchange that can tell on you, which mm -hmm. just, you just want to eliminate the record. It's not going to hurt you if you did it, but it's just why, why have the record? Um, if you're giving your SSN date of birth name and IDs to a party, a third party, then you risk tax reports. So if you're not doing that with a shapeshift forum or whatever, then you're fine. They're not mm -hmm. going to have the ability to report on you. Yeah, that answers so. it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that was kind of my question because I, I do know shapeshift has been do doing some innovative things. So I don't know if they have like a sign up process now. Is, shape shift, is, is it decentralized? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know if you would say it was decentralized. Because the mm -hmm. reason why Atomic Wallet can't be regulated like Coinbase is because literally it can't be regulated. Literally can't <laughs> there, be. Yeah. yeah, there's no way, there's no body to make them sit down at a table and say, you will follow these rules. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I don't know enough to answer that part. I, I don't know. Okay. 
I know there's a technical definition of decentralized, so I don't want to step on it. <laughs> you know, if you haven't gotten a 1099 yet from your exchange, you probably won't. And in that case, definitely answer no on the 1040. So, um, it, yeah, they, they should be out by January and you should expect them by email and also check your profile with the exchange because sometimes they'll post it, but they have to email it to you. That regulation I just showed you, I believe somewhere in there is a requirement for the for large volume businesses like the exchanges to have to email it to people. But yeah, I would just, I would say no, uh, if you did not get a 1099. For me, I would still say no <laughs> if I get a 1099. I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say yes, but anyways, I think once you get past this year, you'll be fine if you follow that recommendation and not uh, put your allocations on the exchange so everyone can see them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like what you said about Shapeshift. You know, they don't have your name. They don't have your social security number. That's the key thing, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, with so much, so much that you do with cryptos, you know, once, once you get past Coinbase, yeah. you're, you're out in the crypto sphere. You know, That's right. They're, they're called the cryptocurrencies. <laughs> Use it for what it was designed. You don't need to be on Coinbase uh, trading coins. Exactly. There's no need for that. So, And, you know, even... I, I believe the law is the same in all the countries and I'm, I'm not willing to tell people the same exact thing that I tell them in the States, but uh, um, mm. you can diminish the value of the account. And, and just, I just, I took a standard uh, partnership agreement from Canada the other day and I read through it. It's what, it's what CPAs write. It's what attorneys over there write. And it clearly sets you up for a tax liability when you certainly don't have to do those things. And I believe that a lot of these things are run on policy, just like, these regs here, they have nothing to do with crypto exchanges. And I'm, I'm not even being, you know, talking about semantics. I'm just saying it would, that type of transaction is completely different, but they're trying to get people to behave a certain way so that then it becomes acceptable. And then when they do manage to write regulations, well, then everyone will say, well, that's fine. We're doing mm -hmm. that anyways. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a good question from Tony. I bought, bought and only held crypto this year. What's the best uh, way to transfer to my LLC account? Yeah, just move from wallet to wallet when you're ready to take dollars out, move from wallet to wallet. Your wallet that you're holding it in now to the wallet at the LLC account at your exchange, right? Um, here's another way. I know some of you are with Caleb and Brown, okay? And this is a good example. You do not have to wire money from Australia back to the States. You can, I don't think I would do that. But if I'm gonna move a million dollars or $10 million, I would simply, I would go for my Bitcoin wallet. So whatever coins the money's in, I would consolidate them and put it into Bitcoin if I'm going to spend them on something, right? I would just leave it in my Bitcoin wallet. Who cares where it is? It's not really anywhere. It's on the computer. It's on a network somewhere on the earth. You know, it's, it's not in a country, right? So once you have your, because you have the private keys, you have the wallet address, you can take that wallet address that, that's on at Caleb and Brown, for example, or anywhere, and you can open escrow and you can buy something with it. You can invest it. You can buy real estate. That's a common example. You can buy lots of things through escrow. So I would suggest that's a way to use it. That's a better way to use it. Use escrow. Use loans. Um, there's all kinds of ways to move money out. Okay. So just use the tools that we have. Are there more questions? Uh, t t sorry, Tony followed up. Let's okay. say I bought and only held crypto this year. Oh, I'm yeah. rereading the question. I'm sorry. I thought that was yeah. a new one. My bad. Yeah. Well, I hope that, I mean, I hope that answers. Oh, Shapeshift, uh, yeah. Tango is saying Shapeshift does make you sign up for an account. And um, what information is collected? Yeah, that's the, that's the thing we need to know there uh, is if, you know, are you giving your email or are you giving, uh, you know, your name and social? If you're giving your name and SSN and all that, then treat it like Coinbase. Yeah. It's that simple. Yeah, if they're taking it. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. All right. I don't see any other questions. John, are there uh, any uh, fre frequent questions you're getting that you wanted to address before we? Uh, before yeah, we I had a conversation with someone the other day. He was asking about, um, just really concerned about my recommendation not to file because no one says don't file tax returns. <laughs> right. So, so I mean, whenever I have conversations with accountants, and I, I haven't even written this. I don't think I have this written down. I kind of do this on the fly all the time, but. Um, 
there are there are clear examples where an accountant's going to say, well, okay, I guess you don't have to do a tax return that way. Like for example, if I'm going to put my mom's house out of her estate just because it's easier for our family, right? So let's say my mom's the you know still alive. My dad died. My mom's still alive. This is a t typical example question I get. And my brother and I want to you know we want to take the house and she's going to still live there and stuff, but she wants to give it to us and whatever. So what I say is just get a limited liability company and do a quick claim deed, file a quick claim deed and transfer it over um, uh, to, uh, to the LLC, but make yourselves the owner, right? Mm. And, and or your mom, it doesn't matter. And you can control the title that way, right? Um, there's, another, there's another issue I wanna go over. Um, when you transfer, okay, so people ask me this. Um, I, I'm sorry to lose, lose my track here. I wanted to talk about, um, not filing returns. Right. There is no need to file a return in that situation. There is no gain or benefit realized when that, and like you would, if you went to an account and you'd probably say file a return every year. Well, yeah, right. because you, how much are you going to pay him to do that? Right. Right. So that's an example. Another example would be is if I took an LLC and I made a million bucks with it and then I reported it on schedule C or whatever portion of my 1040 is appropriate. Then of course, no one cares about the LLC. Of course, that's what it was designed for. Was designed for that purpose but what if i put what if i took an llc made a million bucks and i'm the single member and i reported a half a million because i just bought a boat with it or some stupid thing like that and the other half a million is sitting out there what do, how do i account for that I, what if i don't hmm. well nothing's gonna happen hmm. there's no there's no legal duty i mean if you guys want to look this up um like i just showed you Okay. If are you still seeing this? Am I still screen sharing? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to go to another section here. 26 USC 72, and it's disgusting how I can memorize this. <laughs> yeah. <Ugh>. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> this is the statute, the one that <laughs> pertains to willfully failing the file. Okay. Willful failure is another word for refusal, <laughs> by the way. So, but willfulness has a very special meaning and there's a, there's a very special uh, criteria for establishing willfulness. It's actually kind of difficult. It's like proving fraud. Now, I'm not saying you ever want to be in a situation where you have to fight this, right? We want to avoid all that altogether. And so far in 26 years I have, I've never created a situation that was worse than when I started um, <laughs> so far. Uh, and I haven't changed what I do, so. But here's the interesting thing. The rule, the, the here's the statute that says, hey, if you don't file a tax return, yeah, you can be accused of a, a a crime and spend one year in jail or whatever, right? Here's all your penalties and stuff, right? But let's yeah. let's just back up for a second, and let's see who this pertains to. It pertains to any person who is required. And if you read this carefully, and you might have to just take some time and figure out where the sentences are, and it goes back to grammar school because you're going to be breaking apart independent and dependent clauses. I'm serious. Yeah. Like this clause here, all these commas, if you break all this apart, you'll start to understand it better. And I have, I will admit this to you, this paragraph here, I've literally spent in the last 26 years probably at least hours reading it over and over again. So you don't think you're going to get this right away, but any person required is nice, but who is that? It's not in here. <laughs> the person who's required not to find the required not stated, but I'm going to tell you who it is. The person who's required to get into all this mess yeah. is the person who files. When I say person, it's either a company or you, whoever files a tax return is that person oh wow that's your whole tax system now you, got, you yeah. gotta let that settle in what john just yeah. said. <laughs> just take a breath here because take a breath and realize what he just you've said you've been doing something your whole life that you're not supposed to but oh. here's the thing because most people believe it if you're conv if you're accused of it or indicted for it a jury will probably convict you of this violation because they think you're that mm. even if you didn't file so 
again, it's all run by policy. So let's, you know, let's be clear. It's any person required. Well, who's the person? It is the person who files a tax return. It's like I've been telling you, just like you can choose what type of tax treatment you're going to get. Is it going to be an S corp? Is it going to be a C corp? What type of accounting are you going to use? Well, you choose that. You and your partners choose that. And then you better stick to it because if you don't, um, it could come up later. So if you, if you just have an LLC that's holding property, um, you're, you've got so many versions of that, it doesn't create a tax situation. And here's a, 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 a related transaction to what I just described. Um, mm -hmm. If uh, here's a clear, ex a, a real example, okay? A gentleman uh, asked me for help. Um, uh, his partner was buying him out of his company. This was after the fact. We, haven't, we hadn't done any structuring, I don't think, before then. And so he, he, so he came to me with his corporate ownership and it was millions of dollars. And his partner was paying him off. And he, so he was uh, selling stock. It was private stock, private stock. So what we simply did is we conveyed the stock from his name to a limited liability company. And this was done without a tax consequence. It was not the sale. It was not the disposition of assets. Now, here's a very important phrase. This is, if you want to guys want to do some research, this is another thing you want to look for, a key phrase. I've, sh I've given you se several, many in this, uh, you know, ex explanation, but this is very important. We were able to transfer the stock without a tax consequence to his company, funding a company, funding an investment, because he owned the stock before, and now he owned the company that owned the stock after. So the beneficial interest did not change. Just the name, just the title of the ownership changed. So the government recognizes this as you know, not a trade or exchange or sale. And you can do this with a car, by the way, at the DMV. You can do this with a house. Um, I have a whole video on doing a quit claim deed in California where I'm explaining we transferred someone's house where he would have paid tens of thousands of dollars just in taxes. He only paid like 50 bucks to transfer the title. It was like a filing yeah, fee or something. And, and, and ironically, in that case, the state provided a checkbox form that we used to identify it as a transfer for estate planning purposes. And this is the phrase I want you to remember. If you transfer an asset or something of value that would otherwise be considered a sale, and if you do it, if you can do a conveyance of property or an asset for estate planning purposes, it is not taxable, it's exempt. And I don't even need to cite some statute. There are statutes all over the place, but it's just the way it is. And I think that's the way it is all, all over the world. Mm. but certainly here in the state. So what, what I did for him is, I, and this is funny because I said, well, just to be sure, I mean, you know, I might know some of this stuff, but let me just double check and see what is going on with your company. Send me the actual charter where it talks about what to do in this situation. So I read the charter and there was a whole page of how to transfer, what happens, what you have to do to transfer stock. And I, and I read, it was like a page and a half. And I got down to the last line and it said, if this conveyance is done for estate planning purposes, please disregard the foregoing. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's what the teachers used to give you in school as a trick in yeah. grade, where you have to read the instructions and it says, don't do your homework. And all the kids went home and did the homework. The government's doing that to you. <laughs> yeah, pretty exactly. much. Pretty much. I had a really cool, I had a really cool teacher. He was, my, he was my instructor in high school and college. This guy was like everywhere. He was like a, some sort of geek. I mean, this guy taught physics. He taught cool. astronomy, computer programming, cool, cool. anyways, robotics. Uh, but he, he told this story one time where I think he, either he was given the test or he took a test in college. And there was this huge test. And the last question was, if, or the last set of instructions was, if you read all these instructions, you passed the test. Yeah, <laughs> please exactly. Give, yeah. <laughs> yeah, please return your test booklet, right? <laughs> and only one guy did it. I think it was him. Only one guy walked it up at least within a few minutes, walked it up, and everybody stared at him. He walked out of the room, and everybody <laughs> got there, and they took the test. <laughs> <laughs> They're all stressing. So, so this is what we've been doing our here. whole lives. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That, yeah, that's what I mean. It's a perfect <laughs> illustration of what, Yeah. Uh, you know, so, I mean, so I, always I, come at, I always come to that conclusion when we, when we do these discussions, John, is like, people <laughs> just say too much. It's like, it's like your kid, they come home, your teenager, I have a teenager, they come home and you're not so sure what they've been doing. Yeah, really. <laughs> they start explaining it to you. Right. The government puts you in that position where you go, well, uh, I had this money. 
and then I sold this thing <laughs> and I, I didn't really mean to do anything. And you know, That's like, right. uh, it was just for fun, dad. And they put you in that position and they're just hoping that you're going to freak out and tell That's them everything. Right. That's right. So what uh, I, did, I did have a, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, you no, finished ahead. That's right. sort of a different topic. I had a direct mm -hmm. uh, question. Yeah. So uh, somebody sent me a message in here, uh, set up. Um, I'm thinking the NM is for New Mexico uh, LLC. Yeah, New Mexico, right. They okay, set up a New Mexico LLC. I know you use that a lot. Ready to open my bank account. Where do I get the abstract that I need to take to the bank? Well, you can write it up. I mean, I provide them when I do those. I mean, okay. it, so they it, should it, just message you. Yeah, I mean, when I deliver a final document, see, I don't deliver those until it's final. So that I don't want you to run to the bank until it's ready. Because right. some people apply for the EIN right when, like, you know, we, he gives me the order. And I'm like, no, 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 you got to wait till it gets registered. So, um, yeah, so I really want to drive home that point about the um, estate planning purposes, okay? So, in his case, in the stock transfer deal, um, I, I wrote up a stock transfer agreement. Now, I didn't write it from scratch. I went and found one that some attorney wrote and I modified it. And I said specifically, this transfer is done for estate planning purposes. And there's another reason why I do things like that because yeah, it's good enough. I know what I'm doing. I could just tell him a certain thing and set up a company and that's good. But the problem is if he runs into some issues in a year or two and can't find me, maybe he can describe what I did or maybe he can't. And maybe the person he's gonna get help after me won't tell him what I told him. And isn't so if I don't document it, then he's in kind of a bad situation, right? If he ever has to try to talk to somebody about it. So I like to document things just in case a person can't find me. So right. Yeah, and then uh, then you have the, the other question I want to cover is um, the state agencies. And I was trying to find you an example of a letter from Kentucky. I di I didn't redact anything, so I don't want to show you everything. But basically, Kentucky and Tennessee and a, a couple other states. After we, after we register a company, they'll send a letter to the company, um, to you basically, uh, and, and telling you that um, you're an employer and you have to file all these forms. And if you do that, <clears throat> you'll be an employer and then you'll be on the hook for taxes. And as time goes on, the taxes will go up because the agencies create tax liabilities just because of the date you registered the company. That's if you file all these forms. And that works for companies that have employees and pay wages and things like that. So be careful about filling out state forms. Pretty much everything you're doing on cryptos, I've never seen a requirement where you have to get a state form of any kind for licensing or uh, you know, running a business or having employees, obviously. Uh, being a money transmitter. Uh, the same thing is true on the exchanges when they're asking you about money transmitter type activities and managing payments and these sorts of things. These are all for third parties. So you're not doing that. You're just taking after tax money from your job and you're saving it and buying cryptos. So don't be so quick to try to, you know, fill out forms and, and figure out language and things like that. And if, of course, if you have a situation like that, let me know. But um, just, just realize you, you, we can understand this stuff. Don't be afraid. All right. I hope, I hope that dispels a lot of fears. Is there anything else I can answer? I think you covered a lot of great stuff today, actually. Um, for anybody who's not already a member, I put a link in there, privacyfightclub.com. That's where you get access to uh, <clears throat> previous webinars, extensive courses that, that uh, John has put together, as well as access to our premium chat room where you can uh, ask your questions anytime. So, yeah, without any other questions, or if there's nothing else you want to address, John, we'll wrap it up for today. It was a good one. Wow. I said 20 minutes, and we've been here for 50 minutes. Okay. So. All right. Well, I hope I covered you gave, enough. You gave him a great, yeah. gave him a great, uh, you gave him a great, uh, we'll do uh, some more. If you guys want to send me questions, absolutely. I will. Yeah, I will get real specific. So I hope this helps and you guys can go start Googling some statues if you really want to. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Another, I, I would just, uh, recommend, uh, right on our homepage, privacyfightclub.com. There's a great interview that we did with Vince, uh, a week or two ago. And, uh, this is a guy who had a massive collection issue that was kind of, put on him by a, a bad business deal. And uh, we talked for about 25 minutes. And those of you who are just starting, if you have any collection issues or anything like that, just watch what he, what he went through. And, and, uh, and uh, I think that'll be very informative for you. So that's right on our homepage if, if anybody hasn't seen that yet. Other than that, we're going to wrap it up. We will repost this uh, probably Monday. Look for it on the website. There is a blog on, Pulse, on uh, privacyfightclub.com 
um, that we've started adding new, we, in the past we haven't, we had some articles there, but it wasn't really featured. Well, now it's featured right at the top of the homepage and there's some great video content there. So make sure you, you check in for that. All right. Thanks everybody. We're over and out. We'll see you in the chat room.